This is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Fang. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for Friday's college football playoff semifinals, breaking down both games with Pamela Maldonado of Yahoo getting her read on Georgia versus Michigan and Alabama versus Cincy and NFL week number 17. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, it is finally here. Semi-final week. You're getting some good movement in your favor. You talked Michigan plus eight and a half last week. It's now seven and a half. Things looking pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I'm I'm happy to get that movement. I'm not as happy that Dax Hill is uh, the Michigan safety is is not in Miami yet. Hopefully that changes over the next uh, what? What do we got? Uh, about 30 hours until yep. kickoff. <laughs> Um, looks like, uh, JT Daniels is healthy for, for Georgia. So kind of, I think we're kind of in this situation as a Michigan fan. You'd like to see him because that means Bennett's struggling, right. uh, which would be a good thing. And, uh, yeah, just excited. Uh, obviously a lot going on here in Ann Arbor, uh, with trying to figure out new year's Eve plans and, and watching the game and stuff like that. Uh, also excited for the other semifinal yeah. game. I actually did some pretty interesting analysis with and without John Mechie. Which, uh, if if you want to hear about, we'll go out in my newsletter, f- New Year's uh, New Year's Eve morning before the game, and um, yeah, I was a little bummed to kind of miss out on Cincy plus fourteen, but I did put a little bit on Cincy plus thirteen and a half. I do think this is a pretty good matchup for him, and um, excited for both games. I think yeah. they're going to be both great. Uh, I I do think the SEC teams will win, but I do think we can potentially get some exciting games here. We've I've gotten vibe checks on Michigan for a while now. Uh, where is Ann Arbor at on this team right now? Is there optimism, like cautious optimism? How are they feeling about this team in, in Ann Arbor specifically? I think there's cautious optimism. I and mean, I think there's, in terms of the market, I think there's a lot of similarities to what we saw with Ohio State yeah. being about a touchdown favorite going up, going down, things moving late for Michigan. Obviously, there's there's a whole history and emotional stress of dealing with Ohio State which is absent right. uh, against Georgia. I think you have to respect Georgia as a really, really great team that's had a phenomenal season. I think you also have to acknowledge that they didn't play that tough a schedule this year, except for that Alabama game. I, I'm looking forward to seeing how Michigan's offensive line plays against probably the best uh, front seven in college football. I think that's where the game gets won or lost. So it should be great. Yeah, should be a lot of fun. We're going to break that down with Pamela Maldonado of Yahoo getting your thoughts on that game and also Cincy versus Alabama. You can find Pamela on Twitter at PamelaM35. Uh, again, all of her work over at Yahoo.com. We're going to break down the college football semifinals. We're going to talk about other bowl games she likes for the rest of the year and also NFL week number 17 and some big games over there. Before that, though, quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, you name it. You can find us there. While you're there, hit subscribe and also leave us a rating and review if you like what you hear. Before we talk to Pamela, though, got to go back to last week and recap how things went in NFL Week 16. Covering the past. All right, on our show last week, we uh, had two bets we agreed on because it was just the two of us talking about what our numbers said about NFL Week 16. The first one was the Cardinals minus two against the Colts, and we did get some movement here. Uh, Closed at minus three, so impactful movement in our favor there. It was just the same thing that has hurt the Cardinals this entire past month, though, where they moved the ball but had trouble finishing drives. They missed two field goals. They had another turnover on downs in Indy Territory. They lost 22-16, and those missed opportunities were the key difference in this game. So as someone who's been on the wrong side of two of those games, Ed, uh, the Rams game and then this one, very frustrating team. Even when they get into plus territory, it just, for whatever reason, it's not worked out so far. Yeah, I think these things are all temporary. I mean, I think they've had some issues on fourth down, and and uh, but that offense is good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even without DeAndre Hopkins, the, you know, the, their passing success rate numbers have been pretty decent over those last two games without him. So I do think we're going to see better things. Uh, you hit a couple of those fourth downs. Uh, it's going to be a whole different story. And, uh, yeah, I'll be talking about the Colts later. Uh, that number moved to six uh, for Cardinals Cowboys this week as well. Um, that is interesting. Uh, given Rodney Hudson's yeah. back, I'm not talking about that game in the future, but I... 
I think plus six is pretty good there. So uh, yeah. check out the Cardinals for a bounce back potentially this week. The second game went much better for us, both in terms of movement. The uh, movement was going to both, but the movement was good here. And the result was good too. That was the Bills at plus two and a half against the Patriots. This one moved all the way to plus one by Sunday, despite the fact Cole Beasley and Gabriel Davis are both ruled out for COVID uh, before that game. The Bills, I don't know, pretty much dominated during this game. Uh, they won outright by 12. They outgained the Patriots 428 to 288. They picked up 28 first downs. So good movement uh, for both games and a win here for the Bills. Uh, that one I felt pretty good about all week. There was never really any massive, massive worry on my end about that game. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, my numbers are the Bills winning outright. And I think they showed what they haven't showed all year in that they're a prime Super Bowl contender when, <laughs> I mean, in particular when they play the best. Yeah, and they, if I look at my like my numbers, uh, they got a pretty big boost from that game. So uh, the Bills, fun that's team, good. interesting team, volatile team, but volatility can be fun for sure. So that's week 16. We're going to talk about week 17. In addition to the college football playoff semifinals with Pamela Maldonado, again on Twitter at PamelaM35. Find her work at Yahoo in just one second. But first, FanDuel is now offering an exciting twist to the beloved same game parlay, introducing the Same Game Parlay Plus, which allows you to combine same game parlays across multiple games. All you got to do is head over to FanDuel Sportsbook and navigate to the Same Game Parlay tab of the first game you're interested in. Select multiple bets from the first game, then hit plus it up. Now you could add more bets from the other Same Game Parlay labeled games. Head over to FanDuel Sportsbook today and opt in to the Same Game Parlay Plus. Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Max bonus $1,000 site credit. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Same game parlay plus available for multiple sports in all states on mobile and web. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Connecticut, call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WIP-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-979. In West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Or in Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. Covering the present. Let's bring Pamela Maldonado into covering the spread now to talk a little bit of college football with the semifinals coming up this weekend. It is exciting. Actually, tomorrow, I guess, as we record right now. It's wild how fast those came up. Pamela, we appreciate the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I'm in a different city than what I'm normally in. So I have a different backdrop. I got a different setup, but you make do with what you got. And I'm what I like about my mic is that I can take it with me. So I <laughs> yeah. ship everything, all my equipment with me, and I have transformed a new office space for the weekend. I'm That's curious so if you have the same experience. Uh, when I fly, Pamela, I have to take my mic out because I'm afraid it looks like a bomb when it's in <laughs> like, because like it's not like an electronic per se. Right. And like I could keep it in my bag, but I'm always worried that it's going to look super suspicious. Do you have the same fear going through security with your microphone? I do because it's like you, it's in a little black box and it's very skeptical, but I did drive because I'm in Texas and I stayed in Texas. So I didn't have to worry about that this time around. Is that Tim Duncan behind you? It is. This is a, you have Tim Duncan <laughs> and Toby. Um, I'm at a friend's house and this is, they are huge, huge, huge. Uh, they used to live in San Antonio. So huge Spurs fans and you're in Texas, of course. And then of yeah. course, Toby Bryant, everyone's favorite. <laughs> Yep. Well, Tim Duncan's the man and I would, uh, absolutely I know, get into a lot of people's. Well, I mean, you got, you got two people, two players there considered, uh, some of the best ever of the last two decades in the NBA. I would definitely side with uh, the San Antonio spur there. Mm -hmm. Pamela, I feel like you're one of the lucky ones because a lot of people are, you know, on the road right now for this time of year. You're in a place where you actually have kind of a cool backdrop. I am here like showcasing my mom and stepdad's like bar uh so like you know if you're in front of like a tim duncan and kobe bryant poster you know you're probably set up better than most of us right now that probably means i have really good friends because they have good taste right <laughs> good taste. exactly exactly so hopefully they are set up for tomorrow as well we've had some bowl mm -hmm. games going on for a while now and they've been kind of interesting i'm just curious how has bowl season gone for you so far from a betting perspective the games that I have bet, I'm being super selective. I've only bet six games. I'm five and one in those games. But for Yahoo, I am predicting every single bowl game. 
And I am above 500, but predicting every single bowl game, trying to keep up to date with the opt-outs, with the COVID situation has been impossible. So trying to, from a... From a content creator perspective, it's been really difficult um, than years before because these this COVID changes, these COVID changes just it, it changes everything. It affects things and players you won't know until like the game day and you posted your article the day before. So your stuff is already outdated. It's just really been it's been tough, but hopefully I've been able to give some people some information, at least at the very least a one-stop shop for who's in and who's out. <laughs> and that's kind of what I've used it for, for DFS stuff, uh, because I'm actually not in New York, which has been great. Cause I can play some college football, DFS, having one-stop shopping to know <laughs> who's in, who's out good for betting, but also really good for DFS. So I've appreciated that for sure. And I'm glad that uh, it hasn't been, you know, too much of a nightmare. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's going to be a nightmare because I'm also providing aside from who's in and who's out, I'm also giving you, what the line opened at and what has it shifted to. And I right. think that's, I think people always tend to forget, well, let me look at the line history. Oh, the line is seven right now. Okay. Well, it was a pick a week ago. <laughs> so like you have to stop and think what made it change seven points. We've seen a lot of games go through the number of zero. That's so rare to happen. And it's happening every other day in college football because of COVID and because of opt outs. So I'm giving also that line history for you to factor in. Yeah, it's a lot of good stuff and, and very helpful information to have. And uh, just as someone who's been consuming it, I appreciate it for sure. Now I want to talk to you, Pamela, here, because this is our final show of 2021. It's a little bit of reflection time here on you as a better. You know, when you look back at yourself and track your stuff, try to go back through what's been successful, what is not, where do you think you you made your biggest growth as a better in 2021? There's two areas that I found that I just really feel like I blossomed. I'm going to be cheesy for a minute. Just blossomed. <laughs> One of those was having confidence in NFL. Um, I didn't, for those who are unfamiliar, I've talked about this uh, before, that I didn't start watching the NFL until 2016. Um, before that, I couldn't tell you anything. Um, I couldn't tell you who was where. All I knew was Tony Romo and the Cowboys <laughs> because, <laughs> my, because of my father, because my family were a Cowboys family, um, not me, myself, <laughs> but you're <laughs> in Texas, that's what you are. So aside from that, like I came into this entirely fresh perspective, brand new. I didn't know coaches. I didn't know staff. I didn't know anybody. I gra that's why I gravitated to the Jags because the players that I knew from college and I loved were on the Jags in the first year that I started watching. So yeah, it was Blake Bortles. It was Allen Robinson. And so that's kind of how I started. I never had that confidence in the first couple of years. I'm trying to find my groove, trying to do what I did in college. It didn't translate to NFL, trying to find my own system. Well, let me see what everybody else is doing. That didn't work. Well, let me try to see this new thing. And I feel like this is the first year where I finally, I know what I want. I know what I'm looking for. I know how to do it. I trust my process. And I've been doing really well ever, uh, the entire season. Maybe I started off a little rough in the couple of, in the first couple of weeks. But in the back half of the season, I really feel like I'm, it's clicking. I'm looking less at more, st more stats, looking less at stats and thinking more of like intuition. And like um, not necessarily what does the book want you to do? But like you do always have to think of that as, as a perspective and you don't necessarily have that type of thinking when it comes to college football because college football, it really is like kind of more, I would say more forward, like to the point <laughs> NFL kind of is a little bit more like intuitive rather than statistical. So I've just really come into my own with NFL and I'm really happy with that. I'm really looking forward to next year. And then another thing was I've really gotten comfortable also with live betting. Um, and that really comes from a lot of people. I think the problem that they have is that you're watching the game. Watching the game is absolutely fantastic. That's absolutely what you should do. But I'm also reading the game. I'm on Yahoo scores and I'm seeing play by play what is happening, how many yards they're gaining. Was it a rushing play? Was it a, a passing play? Was there a penalty? Oh, 69 yard punt return touchdown. And I'm seeing how the line adjusts. So reading it while you're watching it has really um, taught me kind of the tendencies that you can expect for a similar situation to happen in the future. And because of that, I've had a really successful live betting season. Is live betting something you want to stick with going forward because it's been good for you? Do you think it's something that's like sustainable and you want to continue to build around that? I wouldn't say that this is going to be something that I want to do only, but it is something that's an extra tool to have. 
So maybe in early in the season and it, right now it's come in handy for bowl games. Um, I'm doing live betting during bowl games. I can make a prediction pre, but as we talked about COVID and opt outs, those aren't always going to come to fruition. But if you have an idea of what to expect beforehand, you can kind of look for certain things during see if it correlates and see if there's any betting opportunities that you can capitalize on. But other than that, I think it's just an extra tool to have. Um, if you're able to make those predictions pre-flop, awesome, do your bet. And then if you can also find additional opportunities to cash in on during, then why not? Yeah, that sounds good. So Pam, we wanted to have you on today because you can talk both about college football and some NFL games. Let's get into the college football semifinal games. We have uh, Georgia and Michigan. Georgia's a seven and a half point favorite, uh, down from eight and a half earlier. Total of uh, 45 and a half. Mm -hmm. um, this is an interesting game to me because, uh, you know, Georgia's backup quarterback, JT Daniels, is down there, supposedly taking reps in practice. Uh, Dax Hill, uh, Michigan safety, is not in uh, Miami yet. So, what are you seeing in this game? There's a couple things that I see. I like the under and I do like Michigan and I do. And this two kind of correlate, but this is Georgia's wheelhouse. We have seen the only game that we saw Georgia struggle with was Alabama. What does Alabama do? Nothing but pass. And Bryce Young, Heisman winner, he had for Alabama the quarterback. He had a fantastic, fantastic game. He played perfect football. Michigan doesn't pass. <laughs> they're a run-only team. And that's exactly what Georgia's best defense is at. They're they're great at playing run-heavy teams. They shut out Arkansas. They held Kentucky to 13 points. They held Tennessee to 17 points. They limited all three of those teams to less than 75 rushing yards. Michigan, however, is a different type of beast. Not only are they do they have the ability to run like uh Blake Corum and Hassan Hoskins, those are two of the best one-two running back punches that you're gonna have in all of college, but then they also come with them one hell of a defense. And I think that's what's a storyline that people are kind of overlooking here. Everyone's focusing on the Georgia defense against Michigan. Well, I'm really focusing on the Georgia offense, whether it is Stenson Bennett or JT Daniels and how they're going to match up to this Michigan defense, because they are very similar in strength. As far as red zone scoring goes, they're both top 10 in opponent points per play. Their opponent, both top 10 in opponent red zone scoring attempts, red zone scores and touchdowns allowed. I really do like this total to stay under 45 and a half. I don't mind that it has ticked down because it actually has ticked up from the opening line of 44. I would still, I would take that up down to 44, but I also do think that Michigan here really is a live dog because if you can scare this offense, we haven't seen what this offense is really capable of doing because they haven't been playing from a play behind situation other than Alabama. They have not really been tested. They have had their foot on the pedal from a defensive standpoint all season long. Well, now what happens when your defense is not able to sustain its strength because an offense in Michigan is able to find some holes, what's the Michigan off what's the Georgia offense gonna look like? I'm really interested in Michigan here. Yeah, you bring up a good point. I mean, Georgia, I mean, this is I mean, definitively the second best team that Georgia has played all year. And I don't think people would argue about that. But I I think you know, just it, it, their schedule looked good at the beginning of the year and it just didn't really turn out that way. Clemson not being as good, Florida not being as good. And my numbers actually thought Tennessee was their best opponent. So, so I would definitely agree with that point that you're making. And I love that you're bringing up Tennessee as a comparative opponent because that is uh, the statistically Michigan and Tennessee are very similar. They're similar to Kentucky as well. The difference comes in that defense. Michigan is far, far superior, not just in yardage allowed, but in also in that red zone defense. And if you look at the defenses that Michigan has played, they already have been tested time and time again all season long. They defeated, we know how strong a rushing defense Wisconsin has. We know how strong Michigan State's rushing defense is. We know how strong of a defense, both against the pass and against the run, Penn State is, and Ohio State. So that's like four matchups that you have where your offensive strength should not have had that much success against a rushing defense. You were still able to pull out those wins pretty decisively as well. Oh, man, I'm just talking myself into Michigan right now. <laughs> Let me get the money line. <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, the, the spread seven and a half, the money line is plus 220. Do you like them enough to take the money line or you, do you want the points in this situation? Always take the points. You always want to go with what the safer bet is. I know this is sports betting. There's no such thing as a safer bet. Right. But of course, <laughs> if you are allocating um, a one unit bet to the spread, 
then your money line bet should be like 20% or less. And the longer mm -hmm. the odds are, the smaller your bet size should be because it's unlikely to happen. Now, in this situation, I will also say that I took uh, Michigan, what was it? What, we're in December 30th. Before they played Ohio State, I took them to win the Natty. So I am oh. essentially already have a money line bet on them. So there's no reason to add on. Um, however, I will be, I don't have a spread bet yet. And now I, I feel like I'm talking myself into taking Michigan. <laughs> Why not, man? Hey, value va value is value, uh, wherever you can find it for sure. Okay, let's move now to Cincinnati versus Alabama. Alabama, 13 and a half point favorite here. It was 14 last week. It is now 13 and a half. Total is 57. And you talk a lot about matchups, Pamela. You try to mm -hmm. identify strengths uh, versus opposing weaknesses. Here we get strength on strength because it's Jamison Williams, head-to-head -head versus Sauce Gardner. So let's talk about that side of the ball. Who holds the edge for you, the Alabama passing offense or the Cincinnati passing defense? I have been fading Cincinnati all season long. <laughs> this is going to be the one time that I am back in Cincinnati, and hopefully it doesn't bite me in the ass. But I do <laughs> believe this is a really good matchup for Cincinnati because Alabama is so pass heavy. Now, they're not going to be with wide receiver and John Mechie, so is that game plan going to change? This is Nick Saban, and he's going to go with what he knows, and he has a Bryce Young who won the Heisman. He trusts his wide receivers, the next man up. They're going to fill in the role just fine. But Cincinnati defense, it's time to admit it. They are legit. They have been legit. I was, I've always been an opponent of 2020 version is better than 2021 version, and I'm still going to stand true to that. However, it doesn't mean that they're any less, um, any less capable this time around. Because if you look at that Bearcats defense, they have two players who are in the top 50 for passes deflected. They have four players who are in the top 50 for force interceptions. That is, and they're both of which are ahead of Alabama players. They have Deshaun Pace, Kobe Bryant, Brian Cook, Arquan Bush. Those are some of the best linebackers, cornerbacks, and safeties in college. And I know that you want to talk about Bryce Young, and it's Alabama, and it's Nick Saban, and it's Group of Five versus SEC. These books lay the price. They're telling you what the line should be. There's no guessing around. You don't have an edge against the books. It's now just deciding what is your strength? What is your weakness? Does it match up? Bearcat secondary absolutely matches up here. They have the edge here. I love them as an underdog. I'm not confident that they can pull out a win because ultimately, yes, it is Nick Saban and it is Bryce Young. So they can always squeak one out. But this will definitely be more competitive than a 13 and a half point indicates. Yeah, it feels like Alabama, you know, it's not the dominating team that they had in 2020, although that no. defense did have some laps too. Yeah. Uh, they had more defensive laps this year. The offense isn't as powerful. And uh, yeah, no, I would agree with that. Well, also you had Bryce Young who had, let's not forget how terrible they're, they have a ranked 99th offensive line and quarterback protection. This is the one game against Georgia where Bryce Young was not sacked a single time. One game out of how many this season? Was it because that this offensive line all of a sudden turned around, became 99th to now number one? Or is it because they just own Georgia? <laughs> and it very well could be that team. Because in 2020, how they defeated Georgia this year is the exact same way they defeated Georgia last year. So it could just be they have their number. I'm still not convinced that this offensive line is going to stand out. Is going to be, you can't play perfect ball back to back games. Bryce Young, he's definitely capable. I expect him to have more trouble this time around because Cincinnati is still a top 20 pass rush. And so that's going to be another matchup to watch. Yeah, that offensive line has also impacted their rushing game, which means it's an atypical Alabama team in that regard as well uh, mm -hmm. because it's not as dominant as they typically are, which is kind of what you think about when you think about the the semifinal wins over other lesser teams. It's been through the ground game. So we'll see mm -hmm how that plays out here. Now, Pamela, while we got you here, might as well ask you any other games standing out for you. You said you've been selective uh, on the college side of things in bowl season. Any other numbers standing out to you with where things stand right now? Um, Notre, Notre Dame is one that I'm interested in. I've been, I've been talked about how I'm an a, a opponent of Cincinnati. I've really been a proponent for Notre Dame and I really wish that matchup that they had against Cincinnati where they lost. It, what was it? I believe the final score was like 24, 16 or something. That was at the worst time for the Fighting Irish. They had a Jack Cohn who had gotten down the game prior from injury. So they were playing a three quarterback system that just they couldn't figure it out. There was a couple of interceptions. It, it, they couldn't just find their groove. But had Jack Cohn been healthy in that matchup, 
it could be Notre Dame in this spot right now instead of Cincinnati. And I just believe this this team is really as strong as they have ended off their season. They are minus three point favorites to Oklahoma State, and I believe that that is a good line to have. Oklahoma State quarterback Spencer Sanders. We saw how terrible he can be, and that was against Baylor. He had zero touchdowns, four interceptions, and two sacks. However. They were without the running back in Jalen Warren, and he is expected to be back in this matchup. But just like Oklahoma State, Notre Dame is a top 10 in quarterback pressure. The huge difference, though, is in takeaways, and the Fighting Irish are top 15 in forcing turnovers. So now you have a quarterback in Spencer Sanders, who's already shown how capable he is of throwing the ball over to the other team against the Fighting Irish team is fantastic at at forcing those turnovers. I love Notre Dame in this spot. Excellent. So let's move on to the NFL. Uh, We got uh, Chiefs at Bengals. Uh, Chiefs are a five and a half point favorite in Cincinnati. Total has gone up to uh, 51. What are you seeing in this game? I'm looking at the over and we talked about how this line ticked up just a smidge. And I agree with the line movement. You have the strength of the Bengals. The ability is to score for, for them is the ability to score from outside of the red zone. They lead the league with 19 touchdowns. The Chiefs are fifth. So you have two of the top teams who don't need to get downfield because they can put up points from midfield. They can put up points from the 40 and from just inside their territory. Inside the red zone, the Bengals are second in the league in converting those trips into touchdowns. They are not scoring field goals. They are putting up seven points. And the Chiefs, over the last three weeks, they lead in points per play, scoring 34 points or more in all three affairs that they've had. Both of these teams defensively, they're 25th and 29th against the pass, bottom half in yards per pass allowed and completion rate allowed. And the key here is going to be the touchdown rate allowed. You look at this Chiefs defense and you're saying, well, you know, they've been playing some really good defensive ball as of lately. Well, you have to also look at the quarterbacks that they have faced. They played the Packers without Aaron Rodgers. They played the Raiders, who was in the middle of that off-field situation. They had the the Cowboys, who did not have their top two wide receivers in C.D. Lamb and Amari Cooper, because C.D. Lamb went down in that game. Then they played Teddy Bridgewater and then Big Ben <laughs> Brosberger, who we know is, you know, susceptible. <laughs> and then finally, <laughs> once the Chiefs faced a capable offense in the Chargers, what happened? They gave up 400 uh, yards of offense and 28 points. Now you get Joe Burrow, who's coming off a, a fantastic game. This is a game like that replicate? Can he replicate something like that? It was a uh, he scored. What happened? He scored the team's franchise record for the most passing yards in a game. He had 500 in last week <laughs> against the Ravens and 525. That's obviously I'm not saying that that's going to happen here, but you're talking about two offenses that are super super capable of putting up points. I do like the over in this game. Yeah, I, I was driving last week during the games, got to the destination, pulled open my phone, and saw the box score, and was like, is there a bug? It shouldn't be 525 and four touchdowns. Like, what yeah. happened here? I was not upset by any means, but, like, it was wild to see that happen. I think the cool thing you mentioned, Pamela, and that is important for an over, is you talked about the two key prongs in getting a huge point total. You want long touchdowns, the possibility of those, mm-hmm. and touchdowns, not field goals. And if they're going to convert on both those things, I think that adds up well. And also, like you said, this Chiefs defense, you got to account for schedule. And it's been, it has not been, because both the Raiders games occurred after Henry Ruggs uh, Mm -hmm. was released. So I think that that's important to keep in mind, not just the teams they face, but when they face those teams. Correct. And then the Raiders also didn't have Darren Waller. So there's just a couple of situations. They've been fortunate to face these opponents, these passing offenses that were without their key parts. Well, the Bengals are pretty healthy, and Joe yeah. Burrow is doing well. He's coming off a great season. He, Joe Mixon is uh, having fantastic success, and then you, who's his uh, go-to guy? I mean, how often do you see – how often am I taking Joe Burrow's over longest reception, uh, longest passing yardage? What is it? It's usually around the 35-yard range. Right. That's something that hits weekly, and so right. now you have – that's something it really does i would also look at the chiefs total um team total over 27 if you can find it the own uh, i do like the over in this game but it's the unknown for me is in the Bengals and joe burrow and company you know that they're capable of putting up 24 plus i know that the chiefs are going to put up at least 27 um i feel comfortable with that at least it's just a matter of are the chiefs going to run the ball they can also choose their game plan how many drives have we seen them as of late where they're doing six, seven minute long drives because they are dinking and dunking downfield and then a, and then a touchdown. Um, right. That could also happen. But I would look at the team total over for the Chiefs and I do still like the over on 51. 
All right, let's move now to the other uh, marquee AFC game for this week. That's the Dolphins at the Titans. Uh, the Titans, three and a half point favorite. Total is 39 and a half. And we saw the Titans offense kind of come to life in week 16. A.J. Brown is back from injury. And shockingly, they played well once they actually had a good player back on offense. So are you expecting that resurgence to continue here? Or are you skeptical given the Titans have struggled even at times when A.J. Brown has been healthy? We saw AJ Brown back in the lineup last week, and I still took the under prop for Tannehill's passing yardage, and it hit <laughs> because <laughs> the Titans' offense with AJ Brown back is he helpful? Absolutely, he's just another player that you have to defend. But does he make this offense, who still doesn't have Derrick Henry, even more of a threat? I'm going with no, because in 11 games this season with Brown in the lineup, Tannehill has still thrown for under 220 passing yards including last week's win over San Francisco. So um, he is there and they, he is making some big plays. It's just not a high potent passing offense. They still rely heavily on that run game and the Titans best defensive strength. I like the dolphins in this spot plus three and a half. And I, I'm, I'm not quite, I'm not there yet on taking the money line, but I do love the plus three and a half points because the Titans best defensive strength is defending the run. Miami doesn't run <laughs> in rushing yards. They're averaging three yards per rush play on first downs. That's the fewest in the league. And they're 31st for explosive rushing plays. So even with AJ Brown back, this is a Miami team that is doing really well in the passing game as of late with Tua and Miami's defense. They lead in sacks and turnovers. This is the biggest thing for me. Um, they lead in sacks and turnovers. Now in their last seven games, this Miami defense has generated 29 sacks and nine interceptions. Do we not forget how Tannehill just a few a few games ago, uh, he doesn't do very well against quarterback pressure. He had a 4.8 passing average against Pittsburgh. He was sacked four times in a loss. He had a 4.4 passing average against New England, two sacks in a loss. And even against Houston, he had four thrown interceptions. <laughs> now, and then plus he had seven sacks against the Jets earlier this season and a loss. So I think that's going to be the biggest matchup. A.J. Brown is great to have. You can't throw him the ball if you're spending all the time on your back. <laughs> yeah, the Ryan Tannehill has the fourth highest, or the, the Titans as a team, have the fourth highest sack rate in the NFL this year facing a defense that loves to bring pressure. So yeah. he's going to be under heat, and Ryan Tannehill has shown throughout his career that when he's under heat, you can get some bad variants, uh, mm -hmm. and that that can definitely be a thing here. And I think that that does lend itself to at least, like like you said, considering the money line here, just because there is some volatility. And when there are more volatile situations, I'm more okay taking, as you alluded to, a risk and going with the money line versus the points. And I do understand that people are going to look at the Dolphins and say, oh, but who have they played? I get it. You played the Houstons. You played the Jets. You played the Panthers. You played the Giants. These are some of the worst quarterbacks is Tannehill up there? Is he a top half quarterback or is he a bottom half quarterback? I think without Derrick Henry, he's really shown that he's kind of, he kind of is just, he can get the job done, but he's not doing anything that's going to like jump off the wall, jump off the pages here. So this is a very live underdog with Miami taking the points because it's maybe Tua does enough to get the job done offensively, but more so it's going to be this Miami defense that is attacking Tannehill when they need to. I remember checking out the Dolphins playoff odds like five weeks ago and feeling very stupid, but just because I was like, why am I checking this? But hey, they're still kicking. They're still alive heading into this week. That is Pamela Maldonado. Make sure you check her out on Twitter at Pamela M35 and check out all those bowl game write-ups over at Yahoo and check out all of her work there. Pamela, we appreciate the time. Good luck to you with the rest of your bowl bets and on the NFL side of things. Hope uh, 2021 was good to you. Hope 2022 is great as well. And hopefully we will talk to you once again here soon. Yes, happy holidays and happy new year to you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's all. Thank you, sir. So much. I appreciate it, Pamela. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. How's everything going? Good. Um, I was just telling Jim that the weather here in Texas has been insane. I'm wearing a tank top every single day because it's 80 degrees. We haven't had any bit of cold weather. Um, so that's been weird. <laughs> yeah, because you yeah. have ice around this time a lot of times. No, right? no, no. Like, well, they usually don't get ice. They got ice okay. this time last year. Yeah, okay. the blizzard, we had like 10 inches of like ice and snow. And I don't know, maybe we're going to get that again because it's so warm right now. <laughs> Who knows? We got like yeah, half an be. inch, like maybe not even half an inch of ice like a week ago here in Minnesota. And I still can't like walk the dog on the street. I have to like walk in the field because I just like, it's miserable. Ice sucks. So glad you're not dealing with that. You know, I'll take 70 uh, over that every time. <laughs> yeah. How are you? Things going with you, Ed? They're good. They're good. Uh just trying to balance work and hanging out with my boys are home this week. So 
trying to balance that a little bit, but yeah, know, work life balance is so hard when you're in the sports betting industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think it's hard everywhere, but this time of year but, it's miserable. This, this time yeah, this time of year is yeah. really bad for us. That like that I, is for I, sure true. I took yesterday off and like trying to catch up from being off for one day in the middle of the NFL week is just a nightmare. Yeah, so. it's it's, it's kind of rough. It's kind of rough. Yeah, I took a couple of days off. Went to Chicago last week, yep. which was really nice. But but yeah. Uh, yeah. Then you're right. through. Friends and family. Hey, I'm going to spend New Year's with you, except I'm going to be watching the television. Right. Yeah. <laughs> these I'll idiots be physically put around you. Final game on New Year's Eve. They know that was a bad idea. Maybe, maybe this year it's going to work out because we have COVID situations again and true, yeah. the world's going to be at home. Think, but I don't think it's going to work out. I hope I not. I want them to go back to New Year's Day. What is this? I know you can you can compete with the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl. Like, absolutely. Right. We're going to watch the semifinal games. Especially, this would have been a great year for it because you have new blood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Different yeah. teams. It's great. We could have expected that, but yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, it was nice chatting awesome. with you. I yeah, thank you, Pamela. Pamela. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Have a great, uh, happy New Year. You too. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Pamela Maldonado for swinging by and breaking down her thoughts on the college football playoff semifinals and NFL Week 17 and Ed. One game she touched on there was the Notre Dame versus Oklahoma State game. Notre Dame, two and a half point favorite. Pretty interesting game there, given the trajectory and I think the the way Notre Dame played uh, down the stretch this year. For sure. I had Notre Dame as one of my three overrated teams heading into the season. I do this based on the AP poll, which is actually a pretty good predictor of team strength and, and future performance. And the real reason was the defense. They brought in Marcus Freeman as a defensive coordinator. They lost a lot of talent from last year, but that, that defense was still pretty amazing this year. And um, yeah, he's now the head coach. So they had a pretty seamless transition in some sense, right? Just promoting the, the DC. He'll be the head coach in this game. It'll be his first uh, game as head coach. So I do think they're pretty good. Uh, my numbers actually think this is a much closer game than, than the markets think. They do respect Oklahoma State. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, kudos to Notre Dame. I mean, that's, that's yeah. a pretty great season given that they had to replace a lot more production than almost every other team in college football coming into this year. Yeah, they, it was a weird year because there was the non-eligibility year. So the retention rates are so much higher than usual. The teams everywhere that else. deviated. What's yeah. that? Everywhere else. Yeah, everywhere else. Uh, the ones that deviated were Notre Dame and then like Northwestern is the one that weirdly lost right. a, lot, a lot of production. That one actually mattered. The Notre Dame one, uh, not as much. Uh, watching Ian Book on Monday, you can kind of see why it may not have mattered as much. Uh, well, at least on the offensive side of the ball, that uh, they lost some production there. Let's move now to covering the future for this week. And Ed, you, you teased it before. You're talking about the Colts for this week facing the Raiders. Uncertainty around Carson Wentz. What's your read on Colts versus Raiders? Right. So the biggest deal in this game is that Carson Wentz is on the COVID list. And right now it looks like rookie Sam Ellinger from Texas is going to start this game. The NFL changed their quarantine rules. So uh, an unvaccinated player like Wentz could actually come back uh, off this COVID list on Sunday and play. Uh, the mark is a move from six and a half to seven favoring the Colts, which suggests that that is a, is a very likely scenario, uh, you know, Wentz actually playing, but I mean, I think I've talked about it on the show before. Like, my numbers really dislike the Colts. I mean, the pass offense is awful, even with Wentz. They're 22nd when I look at my adjusted success rate, and the offense has really been reliant on big plays from, from Jonathan Taylor. Um, you know, just for one, one example of the, the Colts' ineptitude on passing, uh, against New England, uh, Wentz had 49 passing yards after you subtract out the eight yards from a sack. So they haven't been productive there. They've been really, really reliant on Taylor. Big plays. I don't think that's sustainable. I know I've said that before, but you know, it's also like the pass defense is also a problem as well. Uh, my numbers uh, put them in the bottom part of the NFL at 24th. When I look at adjusted success rate. Now you look on the other side of the ball and it's been a crazy season for Las Vegas. Obviously the whole Gruden issue, changing coaches, Darren Waller hasn't been around, but then you kind of look and they're eight and seven and squarely in playoff contention. And they're probably the definition of an NFL average team, um, which I think you could have kind of projected uh, at the beginning of the season. Their pass offense has traditionally been very good with Derek Carr. And, 
you know, just a couple breaks on defense. Uh, and that defense looked pretty good for a little part of the season. Right now, when I do my predictions, like, I mean, they're they're like just a smidge under NFL average. And I think that's exactly where they belong. Um, you know, the defense, uh, like I said, was a g- pretty good at the beginning of the year. They've regressed a little bit. They're 20th when I look at my adjusted passing success rate. But they can still throw the ball. Uh, you know, Derek Carr has is leading the fourth best pass offense with my adjusted success rate. Um, you know, even the last two weeks without Darren Waller, they uh, had a success rate over 50% against Cleveland and Denver. Those are two of the better pass defenses in the NFL this year. And the NFL average for passing success rate is about 44%. So they haven't really put the points on the scoreboard those last two games, but um, the the underlying fundamentals have been there. It's also an intriguing game too, because you got a bunch of guys on the COVID list, like Casey Hayward and, and Darren Waller and guys who could come off on Sunday. Waller has been hurt too. So, right. you know, I kind of, I think I read that he practiced Wednesday or practiced earlier this week. He was supposed so to return on, on Wednesday, I believe, but then he got COVID. <laughs> yeah. So now he's on the COVID list. Um, Hayward played last week, but he's on the COVID list as of Monday. He could come off. So there's a lot of question marks there. Um, you know, my numbers see this as a much closer game. I have Colts by about two. Um, so I do see value given all the uncertainty. I think a lot of that could play in my favor. So uh, I like the Raiders side here. The Raiders are a really weird team because I have a pretty big downward adjustment in my numbers for them without Henry Ruggs. Like I manually tweak it to account for that. And despite that, it had value on them versus the Browns before the COVID stuff cropped up, showed value on them last week against the Broncos. I have no idea why they were an underdog against Drew Locke. That was wild. This week it has, and this is again, I think my numbers tend to be lower on the Raiders. If you assume Wentz plays and is good to go, it has this game at six and a half. If you put Ellinger in there, it's a 1.4. And the way that Wentz works, the logistics of it, he can be activated on Saturday. He must be activated Saturday in order to go. Oh, really? He, he could be activated Saturday and not cleared Sunday morning. So we could get a news at 4 p.m. on Saturday. Hey, the Colts activated Carson Wentz. That does not mean he will play because he has to be activated right, by right, Sunday, right. but then like, taking up a roster spot. He could still not clear protocol on Sunday morning and still sit. So even if we get past that hurdle of four o'clock on Saturday that, hey, he was added to the roster, you, you know, they, 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 you would think that he'd play. That's not a guarantee at that point. So when I look at this number and see seven, my numbers say 6.5, your numbers say two. And if I assume that there's like a 10% chance Carson Wentz sits and it's at 1.4, if I get that 10% outcome, I feel like that to me says I, I should probably just take the Raiders and see how things break, right? I certainly think so. Uh, I'm on that side too. And and remember, I mean, Wentz is presumably on the list because he tested positive and you have less protection against COVID if, if you're unvaccinated. So there's that whole issue. He's sitting at home this week, working out maybe. I mean, we don't really know. Right. Um, so yeah, a lot of uncertainties. I, I'm rolling the dice with this one. And and uh, I, I mean, you could, you could see a situation where Waller and Hayward come back sure. and Wentz is out. And I don't know where the market would move towards that. And I, I would really like my chances of where I'm at right now. Yeah, I think the the ways this game sets up, I can't I can't see a, a, a put route to backing the the Colts at seven. The Raiders very easy to do do a plus seven yeah. here in right. this game. Also, I think if the Raiders win their last two games, they're in the playoff. Um, and there's probably some situations. I mean, there's at eight and seven, they're squarely have a lot to play for. Right. Um, a talented offense, even without Waller, I'll take my chances. The playoff picture is a wild, wild mess this year. I, I love it, but it's wild. That is for sure. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to mine. A lot of the sides my numbers like this week are ones I am very wary of. It's a lot of big spreads. And when I back test my numbers, they don't perform as well on bigger spreads. So I'm, you know, taking the Rob Pozzola approach where I don't want to go towards those uh, if I can avoid it. There is one they like that I'm on board with, and it's not a bigger spread. It's a small spread. That's the Steelers at plus three and a half against the Browns. And most of this is due to skepticism around the Browns. After accounting for likely unavailabilities for each team across the league, the Browns are 19th in my power rankings. The Steelers are 24th. Uh, that gap is five spots, but the actual like numbers gap between them, not all that large. 
it seems like there's a bit of a recency bias here with the Steelers because yeah, they just got whooped by the the Chiefs 36 10, but and they look bad doing it. They look bad all the time, but like sometimes you know they can look bad and win. They beat the Titans 19 to 13. They had that big near comeback against the Vikings week before that. They won 2019 versus the Ravens before that. So you know, that's not doesn't matter a lot because the Ravens are not great, but they are above the Browns in my power rankings. Right now, my numbers say that Cleveland should be a 0.6 point favorite. We're getting this number at three and a half, which leaves a good amount of wiggle room. We do get the hook there at three and a half. So with the three and a half at minus 115, I'd bet we get to three before kickoff on Monday. So I am good taking this number right now, betting the Steelers at plus three and a half and Riding with them as, as home dogs, I think that this one actually does set up pretty well to ride with the Steelers here. It is not fun to bet on Big Ben. I have had, done, had to do it several times recently. It's worked out. It does not make me feel good, but I'm going to do it once again. Ed, what do your numbers say about Browns versus Steelers? Yeah, my numbers agree with you. I have Cleveland by about one, so they should win the game, but a very tight toss-up type situation. If uh, I mean, if you're going to get Pittsburgh on the, the high side of three, certainly suggest value there. Yep. I will take that for sure. Okay. So our numbers are, Ed likes the Raiders plus seven and I like the Steelers plus three and a half. That is all that we have here for this week on covering the spread. But want to give a big thank you once again to Pamela Maldonado for swinging by and breaking down her thoughts on the college football playoff semifinals and NFL week 17. Check out all of her work over at Yahoo and give her a follow on Twitter at Pamela M 35. Once again, a big reminder to make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast will be going throughout the playoffs uh, and throughout the uh, college football season to get you set for the national championship once it comes and much more and of course the nfl playoffs too hit subscribe and again if you like what you hear leave us a rating and review as well ed what is going on for you this week at the power rank so i'm writing my uh email newsletter so a couple newsletters are going out this week tomorrow morning uh, friday morning would be my last three insights into those uh semifinal games both of them and um, yeah, sign up for that at thepowerrank.com. All righty. And find Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank. I'm at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. You can find our daily fantasy podcast for NFL Week 17 up on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast that has been posted already as well. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you for tuning in throughout the entirety of the 2021 calendar year. Have a happy, safe, and healthy New Year's. We'll talk to you once again in 2022. Good luck with your bets. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's up, guys? This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.